October 7th was a cataclysmic event for Jews in Israel and all around the world, but it meant different things for different Jews. It was a lot easier for Jews on the right than Jews on the left to understand what happened. I'll have all the details coming up on In Focus. October 7th was a history-stopping and changing event for Jews all around the world, for Jews in Israel and for Jews in the diaspora. But the way that Jews understood October 7th and what it meant for Jews on a, and what October 7th meant for Jews was very different if you came on the right or if you were a Jew on the left. Let's go first to Israel. So in Israel, Jews on the right were just as stunned by what happened as Jews on the left were. The, the, the level, the, the, the velocity of the events and the sadism that, uh, that uh, sort of characterized the slaughter of 1,200 Israelis in the Gaza border area on October 7th was shocking for Jews on the right and for Jews on the left alike, for Israelis all across the political spectrum, and really for Arab Israelis as well, by and large. Uh, people just had never seen anything like it before. They had never experienced anything like it before. But for Jews on the right, it wasn't unimaginable. It wasn't unimaginable because right-wing Israeli Jews uh, did something all along, which is they listened to what Israel's enemies say. They, We understand, we I'm one of them. Jews, Israeli right-wing Jews, understand that we have to listen to our enemies when they say that they want to kill us. We have to take them seriously. This was basically the iron law of Jewish survival uh, from time immemorial. Those who listened to our enemies when they said they want to throw us into the sea or that they wanted to kill us, we believed them. And we lived our lives as people who were under threat of extinction, under threat of annihilation. Um, and, you know, we've had over the past many decades, many, many organizations of Israeli Jews, political parties of Israeli Jews that are based around this basic understanding that we have to listen to our enemies. We have to listen to the Iranians when they say they want to wipe us off the map. We have to listen to Hezbollah when they say death to Israel. We have to listen to the Palestinians from Hamas and from the Palestinian Authority who call for jihad and the annihilation of Israel. And we did. We listened to them. Here, just listen to what they said over the years. Israeli right-wing Jews listened to all of these things, and we said, we have to prepare. We have to take them seriously. You had organizations like Memory. I've had Eagle Carmon on. Uh, the show, the president and the founder of Memory Middle East Media Research Institute that goes over the Arabic media and translates it into Hebrew, translates it into English and to other languages so that people will listen to what the leaders of the Arab world are saying, what the leaders of Iran are saying, so that people will listen to them and take them seriously. We have Palestinian Media Watch, whose work we've often cited on this show that also was founded after the fake, the phony peace process with the PLO was launched in 1993 in Oslo that said, listen to what Yasser Arafat is saying, listen to what Mahmoud Abbas is saying, listen to what the leaders of the Palestinian Authority and the Hamas are saying. They're saying that they want to annihilate us. We have to take them seriously. These organization, think tanks, uh, media, uh, media organizations, newspapers, websites. I started a satire uh, site called Latma. All of these things to wake people up, to wake the Israeli left up and say, look, we have to take this seriously. So that when Hamas terrorists and thousands of Gazans, civilians, supposedly innocent, stormed into Israel on October 7th and invaded our kibbutzim and invaded our border towns and, and massacred everybody that they could get their hands on and slaughtered them with sadism that nobody could have ever imagined before. It was unimaginable, but it 
wasn't surprised because they've been saying it all along and the Israeli right understood it, understood we were at war, understood that this is a war for our survival, that it's always been a war for our survival because they've always said that they want to annihilate us. So for the Israeli right, it wasn't a shock, but it has been for the Israeli left. So the Israeli left, you know, especially since 1993, but even really since since the end of Yom Kippur War, we had Professor Elisha Hassan on around the 50th anniversary, right before October 7th of, uh, of uh, the Yom Kippur War, explaining the various ways that Israelis on the left and Israelis on the right looked at what to, the, the lessons that they took from, October, from, from uh, the Yom Kippur War. And the idea that the Israeli left took from that war 50 years ago and really became the organizing principle of the Israeli left for the past 30 years is that the Palestinians are appeasable, that there's it's our fault that they've been at war with us, and that we can appease them by giving them land. Specifically, we can give them the land, uh, the Gaza Strip, which Israel took from Egypt, which was secured from Egypt during the Six-Day War, Judea and Samaria, uh, which we took control over from Jordan and unified Jerusalem, which Jordan also occupied uh, until 1967. We can, if we give this lands back, back, not back because it was never theirs, but if we give the Palestinians these lands, we let them have a state there, then they'll be appeased and it'll be over. And the real problem here, the source of the friction is Israel and specifically the Israeli right-wingers who say we can't give that land back. And so their whole concept was that the Palestinians are appeasable and that the problem are the Israeli rightists who don't want to give them the land. And so they they supported all of the withdrawals. They supported, they actively championed and, and lobbied for Israel's withdrawal from Lebanon in 2000. Um, they were against the Lebanon war the, the, when, when Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982 to push out the PLO and in what was called Fatah land, very similar to Gaza, which was a self-governing Palestinian uh, state, with state uh, or this was in the case of Lebanon, state within a state that was used as a base for terrorism against the northern communities in, in Israel. And uh, they opposed that and they called it an occupation. And they said that Israel was illegally occupying Lebanon or South Lebanon and we had to leave, and that if we left, then everybody who was fighting us by the time we left in 2000, it was Hezbollah, uh, they would be fine. They'd turn into a normal political party. They'd be appeased. This is all they want. And the same thing with Gaza. They were the ones who lobbied for Israel to unilaterally withdraw from Gaza and remove all of the Jewish communities in Gaza, expel all of the residents, even exhume all of the bodies of Jews in the cemeteries buried there and uh, withdrawal of our military forces, even along the international border between Gaza and Egypt. And uh, they would turn Gaza into Singapore of the Middle East. It would become a an agricultural wonder. We left them our greenhouses. It would become a technological wonder. We would teach them high tech and everybody would benefit and everything would be great. And that would be the beginning of a Palestinian state. And in the event, they turned Gaza into um into Afghanistan, Hamas took over, and they turned it into um, the most complex um, uh, uh, guerrilla war um, base ever seen. They have 500 miles, up to 500 miles of subterranean tunnels underneath Gaza that they've used billions and billions of dollars in humanitarian aid to Gaza in order to build. And it's all a war machine directed towards the single goal of annihilating Israel and annihilating the Jews, which we saw them use to such disastrous effect, cataclysmic effect on October 7th. And so that was wrong. And the Israeli left when, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't see it. And again, they, they blasted the right all along. They said that we were alarmists. They said that we were, um, we were fascists because we want to keep Judea and Samaria. They said that anybody who takes our history and thinks that it's important and that we have to safeguard our historic homeland and um, and uh, and defend our historic and legal rights to Judea and Samaria to Jerusalem, um, that they were that they are messianics, that they are fanatics, they are fascists, they are dangerous, um, and we really just have to put aside all of that folklore about. Jewish history and embrace the moment and 
live in the moment and reach an agreement with moderate, like-minded, ahistorical Palestinians, um, and we'll make peace. And the radical bitter, bitter enders on the Israeli right and Hamas, they'll just uh, fall by the wayside of history and be forgotten because the good moderates on both sides are going to get together and build uh, peace and a two-state solution. And that fell apart completely on October 7th. And so you've seen a real split within the Israeli left. You see um, the, the, the residents of the Gaza border communities, for instance, who have woken up and said, uh, this can't go on. Like, we just have to completely change. You know, you right-wingers really were right. And here I want to show you a clip uh, that was of an interview with a... Uh, a resident of Kibbutz Be'eri. Let me just give you real quick his name. His name is Aviada Bachar, and he's a resident of Kibbutz Be'eri. And listen to what he says about what he and his fellow residents of Kibbutz Be'eri learned on October 7th. And we have to keep in mind before you see this clip, just a little intro. Kibbutz Be'eri is, has always been and a kibbutz affiliated with, with the radical left of Israel. Its members, like the members of other kibbutzim that were overrun, Kfar Aza, Nachal Oz, and others, you know, they were some of the most outspoken champions of the expulsion of the Jews living in the Gaza Strip, then Gush Katif in northern Gaza, and the transfer of the entire area to the Palestinians believing in coexistence. They would pick up Gazans from uh, Eras Crossing and take them for medical care in Israeli hospitals, even when it was illegal. They they had Gazans, the minute that they were allowed to, they uh, employed Gazans to work in their kibbutzim. And many of the Gazans who were working there, as we saw, were actually uh, intelligence operatives for Hamas. And they mapped out their communities and said who lived where, who had guns, who was in the army, who wasn't, who had children, how many children, what the names of the people in every house were. So the Hamas knew exactly what to expect when they invaded Be'eri and they massacred the people of Be'eri on October 7th uh, in the most amazing way. So listen now to what, you know, he he says here, what Abi Bachar says uh, in this interview on uh, Channel 14's uh, popular primetime show, The Patriots. Uh, he said it on uh, Tuesday night. <laughs> של עוטף עזה, יושבים ארבעה קילומטר מהגדר, צריכים לחשוב האם אנחנו מסוגלים לקיים דו-קיום שם. והחשבי לחודש הוכיח כנראה שבמסע ומתן וברמת רוע שהייתה, כנראה אנחנו לא מסוגלים. אנחנו לא יכולים עוד. כי נתנו הכל, הם עבדו אצלנו, ובעצם בסוף התבדנו. אני אומר שאני חושב היום שרצועת עזה אין לה זכות קיום. אנחנו בעצם מגיעים למצב שהילדים שלהם שרפו אותנו בממ"דים, המבוגרים יותר ירו בנו דרך הדלתות, ומי שקפץ החוצה מהחלון ירו בו עוד פעם. והדבר הזה צריך להבין שהמבוגרים על כיסאות גלגלים ועל, והנכים הגיעו לבארי, מבזזו אותנו ולקחו אותנו שבויים. צריך להבין את המצב הזה. ושבן אדם מעלה, מעלה את המשא ומתן לאין סוף, כנראה זה או שאנחנו נלך או שהם ילכו. ואסור לנו ללכת. אנחנו חייבים לשקם את המקום הזה, ואנחנו נשקם את עוטף עזה, ונחזור לבארי, והיא תהיה יותר טובה ממה שהיא הייתה. זה בטוח. So what did we just hear? We just heard him say, we were deluded. We were wrong. We believed in peace, and we discovered that it's all or nothing, that it's a zero-sum game. They burned us alive. Their children burned us alive, and their adults shot us in the faces. They, there is nobody to talk to. Their elderly came in on crutches and in wheelchairs to loot us and to assault us and to and to kidnap us as hostages uh, in Gaza. And there is no coexistence with Gaza. It's either us or them. That's what he's saying. We have to defeat them. You know, they they have to be. They sh they have to leave. You know, they have to. They can't be our neighbors anymore. You know, let them. Find, find refuge in third countries. We can't allow them to continue to exist here as a, uh, as a coherent political entity any longer because, because we can't, because look what they are. They're Islamo-Nazism, that, that's all. And they will never accept us and they will always seek our 
annihilation and any opportunity they get, they will murder us again and again and again. So this is what he's saying. It's not just him. That's why 70% of leftists that were polled say there's no chance of pe peaceful coexistence. But so the leaders, the very top echelons of Israeli society really are our 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 permanent state, our ruling class, are, are comprised of leftists who owe their power and their prestige and their class identity to maintaining this bifurcation, this balkanization of Israeli society. And I'm writing an article now on JNS, it'll go up on Thursday, on uh, January 25th, about how it's impacted the general staff of the IDF and what's happening as a result. Um, but I think that, you know, even though we do still have our, our ruling class and the general staff and the legal, uh, in the legal fraternity and our media that's all working on demoralizing us and trying to force us back into, along with the Americans, into this two-state solution um, delusion and base our strategy on that, what Bachar uh, Aviada is saying is, is obviously correct. You know, the future is telling us what it requires us to do today. If we're to have a future, there are certain things that we have to do based on what we've learned about the Palestinians. You know, and, and that's why, you know, and I'll just say one more thing about the right. You know, because people on the right have always understood the existential nature of the conflict, we put our money where our mouth is. More to the point, we put our children where our mouth is. And we put our sons where our, our mouth is, which is why when we look at the casualty figures of of the from the war, we see that even though, for instance, religious Zionists who are one of the backbones of the right in Israel make up just I looked on the 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 Israel's uh, Central Bureau of Statistics yesterday when I was thinking about this, religious Zionists make up only sixteen percent of the population, or did in a twenty sixteen study that I found. Um, and yet 45% of the soldiers killed in action are from that community. So three times their number, because the better you understand the nature of the struggle and what it is that we're fighting for, and you sanctify our rights and you believe in them and you believe in the country and you believe and you understand what the threat is, uh, the more you understand that it's necessary to sacrifice for freedom. And so you send your sons uh, to fight in the IDF and not to these, you know, rear units and technology heavy where they get to sit in in, in uh, offices for their time, uh, their mandatory military service, etc. And that's why you're seeing these numbers. And if you look at the uh, fatality rates more generally, obviously all of them are our children, but the overwhelming majority of the soldiers who are who are dying are from the peripheries and are from communities that are 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 on are on the right are among the the majority of Israelis who identify with the right. So it's not surprising that right wing make up the majority of Jewish Israelis, um, and an even larger majority of them are are represented among uh, the fighting men in the field in Gaza and, and in other and in other fronts and that we're facing, particularly in the north. So that's that's what's happening. We we put our money where our mouth is. And by the way, the left also put their money where their mouth is. They believed in coexistence. They continued to live along the border with Gaza. They believed in the fence, that good fences make good neighbors, and you don't have to worry because your neighbors, the minute you leave them alone, it's a live and let live kind of thing, and they'll be happy. And they believed in that, and they got slaughtered. They got slaughtered. And now they're waking up to it. So I think that even though our our... Our elites, our ruling classes, don't want to acknowledge it that the that the truth comes from the ground up, and um, and the people aren't going to let anybody off. We can see here some footage of uh, of a protest that took place uh, this morning at Karim Shalom Crossing. You know, the United States has forced Israel to bring in so-called humanitarian aid into Gaza, and so this organization called Emergency Orders, basically. Um, they they have been protesting by Karim Shalom and the and the IDF has tried to turn it into a closed military zone and to block them from coming in. But here you can see in this protest uh, that the protesters managed to get to Karim Shalom Crossing, where all the trucks are lined up to give fuel to uh, Hamas and food to Hamas and medical supplies to Hamas in order to make the Americans happy. And the Israeli people said. No, 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 no. This isn't going to go on any longer. Uh, it's too dangerous. The aid can't come in. So I think that in Israel, because the threat is so overwhelming 
And because large swaths of the left woke up to the dangers that the right had always seen, that we're going to see a sea change. Uh, and and God willing, that is that is the that is the reason that we're going to fight to victory, despite you know what what uh, what our ruling class of leftists is trying to engage in, which is demoralization of the public and uh, surrender essentially in the name of freeing the hostages to allow Hamas to survive and fight another day and not have control over Gaza and not cause them to have a complete collapse. So that's what's happening there. Excuse me. And now I just want to move for a second to America. So if the big fight between Israelis on the left and Israelis on the right was over whether or not our our enemies should be taken seriously when they tell us that they want to wipe us off the map, the American Jews have sort of two major issues that have defined the struggle between right and left in America. I mean, there are a lot of different things, obviously. It's not it's not completely parallel because they're a minority community in 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 a much larger society of which they are an integral part uh, and fully integrated into American society at all levels. So it's it's a, it's not the same, but there are certain things that are 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 notable. And the two major issues I would say that American Jews have sort of divided over. Um, if you take out the ultra-orthodox American Jews from the from the equation, because they don't play that much into it, um, you have the issue of uh, how to deal with allegations that Zionism is a form of racism, and more, more broadly or more currently, the uh, BDS movement in the United States, the call to boycott uh, supporters of Israel in the United States. And on the other side, you have what's called the diversity, equity, and inclusion which uh, says that um, you have to divide people between two classes, oppressors and oppressed. They put them uh, and and advance everybody who's considered oppressed and at the expense of the people who are considered oppressors. And uh, the DEI uh, religion, the cult that has taken over all of the major institutions in the United States today, um, they are opposed to meritocracy because merit is considered an advantage to the oppressor class and the oppressed are not considered as meritorious and therefore it's throwing merit by the wayside. And American Jews um, are threatened existentially, really, as a community and as individual Jews, frankly, by both of these, by both of these movements, by the Zionism is racism slash BDS uh, campaigns on the one hand and by the DEI campaigns on the other hand. So the Zionism is racism issue uh, essentially says that American Jews, and I'm using, and, and it's true of all diaspora communities, but because the American Jewish community is the largest and most influential one, and, and, and until very recently also very, very powerful community, um, I, and also because I'm most familiar with the American Jewish community coming as I do from from the United States, um, I think uh, I, I'm specifically talking about them. But they, but they, um, the and the Zionism is racism BDS movement, such as it is, or campaign, and it's really been going on since the 1970s. Is excuse me, is telling American Jews that they're not allowed. They're not free to be themselves. They're not free to be Jews. That if they choose to be proud Jews and support the Jewish state, which is sort of one of the one of the three foundations of Jewish identity, it's the Jewish, uh, it's the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and the land of Israel, and the Torah of Israel. Those are the three components of a Jewish identity. And so, particularly if you're not a religious Jew, then the two components of, of Jewish nationhood, Jewish uh, group identity as a nation, and uh, Zionism, Jewish nationalism, these are the two core components of Jewish identity in the United States. So if the idea that the Jewish National Liberation Movement and the Jewish state are forms of racism and apartheid and they're evil and now they're now like ra- we're Nazis or whatever, then that means that Jewish identity for the majority of Jews in the United States is inherently racist. It's illegal, it's, or if not illegal, it's immoral. And it's socially unacceptable. So the Zionism is racism concept essentially says to American Jews that if you're a proud Jew, you have no place in, pol- in polite society. So that's about ostracism of Jews. It's about um, 
it, it's about bullying of Jews, harassment of Jews, enabling that and legitimizing it. And that's been going on for a long time. So uh, conservative American Jews sort of recognize this from the outset, and they've been fighting this for years. They've been fighting this for years. I mean, if you just go to the back issues of Commentary Magazine, going back to uh, the 1970s with uh, uh, UN National UN um, General Assembly Resolution uh, 3379, declaring that Israel, that Zionism is a form of racism. Um, you know, commentary was fighting this canard from the outset and understood the implications of this this libel, the slander of Jews and Jewish nationalism in the Jewish state from the outset as as truly a, an existential threat to Jewish life all over the world. And they they did recognize this. And and more broadly, the minority of American Jews that identify with more conservative principles, more traditional Judaism always understood the threat, but liberal Jews didn't. They tried to figure out a way to say, look, you know, there are problems with Israel. Maybe there isn't equality between Jews and Arabs in Israel. And so you have all of these liberal Jewish federations who have been donating millions and millions of dollars to Arab Israeli communities, to Arab institutions in Israel, to the Palestinians, to the peace process. You have a multi, multi, multi-million dollar uh, industry of nonprofits in the United States that are dedicated to Middle East peace and the Middle East peace uh, movement or industry or whatever you want to call it is all about uh, supporting the Israeli left against the Israeli right, demanding that Israel concede territory, demanding that Israel make concessions to the Arabs, standing with Iran and appeasing Iran and enabling Iran even to become a nuclear power like J Street has been sort of pushing this agenda, the Obama agenda of appeasing, of nuclear appeasement towards Iran in the name of peace. Um, since it was founded uh, together with the Obama uh, campaign in 2007. And so you you look at the American Jewish community and see that there are parallels, right? That the liberal left, the progressive left in America was always saying, well, you can be pro-Israel and pro-peace, or as Alan Dershowitz always said, you know, you I'm pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian. Um, and and so that hit a wall, of course, on October 7th. But let me just add in the DEI. So the DEI, American Jews, you know, overwhelmingly voted for Barack Obama because it seemed like the natural thing to do. They supported, uh, liberal Jews supported uh, the Black Lives Matter movement because that was, again, the, the right thing to do, they thought, because from the time of the civil rights movement, and even before that, American Jews really did lead the way in fighting in, uh, institutional racism in the United States, the Jim Crow laws, segregation uh, in the United States, going back to the Julius Rosenberg, who uh, uh, Jewish Julius Rosenwald, one of the owners of Sears Roebuck, who founded the NAACP back, I don't know, in the 1930s. So, you know, you're talking about a long legacy of civil rights uh, championing on the part of American Jews. And so it it never occurred to them, for liberal Jews, that there could be any backlash from doing something, which on the face of it was so, it was so obviously the right thing to do, being opposed to racism. But over time, um, this the the children and the grandchildren of the pioneers of Jewish support for civil rights for African Americans in the United States did it blinded d deliberately blinded themselves to the growing uh, uh, anti-Semitism among Black nationalists in the United States, and they didn't want to see it, and they wouldn't see it, and they continued to the point where um, American Jewish support for Black Lives Matter was completely. Uh, self-defeating because Black Lives Matter, if you read their charter, they supported the annihilation of Israel. And um, it, it didn't make sense anymore already going back to 2019, 2020. So, and even before that. Um, so they didn't want to see it. Uh, they didn't want to believe it because they wanted to believe that they, they wanted to continue to be at the forefront of this movement the way that Julius Rosenwald had been and uh, and uh, Abraham uh, Heschel had been uh, and other uh, leading American Jewish figures in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement. So that that's what they wanted. And um, 
They couldn't accept it. And then the DEI complex, the basic sort of organizing principle of DEI is, again, that meritocracy is bad. So, you know, Jews make up 2% of Americans and say 25% at the heyday of the student population at Harvard or Columbia or University of Pennsylvania, Cornell, Stanford. And so um, that's because under meritocracy, uh, a, a country that wants the best to rise enables equality, not of outcome, but of opportunity, then Jews to, were able in the places where they excelled to do very well. Jews are, didn't do well in the NBA. They did well on the SATs because everybody has the advantages that they're blessed with and they go forward with them. And that's the idea of equality of opportunity rather than outcome. But the DEI complex is about equality of outcome. And so from a DEI perspective, if you're 2% of the population and 25% of the students at Harvard University, then there must be some sort of conspiracy going on here, right? Because why is it that you're more successful than other ethnic groups? Why is it that strivers from any community are better off than people who aren't? Because that's they're striving to be towards excellence in any outlet that they do. And so then all of a sudden, the, as this DEI complex started taking, swallowing institutions, whether it's higher learning, whether it's Hollywood's screenwriters, whether it's corporate boardrooms or, or journalism or politics, uh, Jews started finding themselves more and more shut out. And that's it's reaching a fever pitch now where you see that Harvard is, in fact, trying to lower Jewish uh, admission to that university, and they're not alone. I'm just picking on Harvard because they're Harvard. And that means that Jews aren't going to be allowed into Harvard based on their ethnic background beyond 2% of every class. That's their that's their goal. That's their goal is to reduce Jewish student population in, in uh, Harvard, at Columbia, at Cornell to 2% at most, since that's all there is, which is interesting because when Jews were under a quota system, in the, up until the 1950s at all these universities, I think the quota was 5 or 10%. So they're actually pushing Jews even lower uh, under DEI in the name of equity. And um, so the DEI movement is actually not only wrecking America, because why, you know, how safe are you going to feel knowing that your pilot on your, on your, on your airliner was chosen because of the color of, of its skin, you know, or whatever, and, and sexual proclivities, et cetera. Uh, not very safe. How how well is a corporation going to do when its top executives were chosen because of the color of their skin or because of their sexual orientation and so on and so forth? Not very well. So if it's not from there, then then not the best people are going to be in charge, and your society is going to collapse just that way. Um, and so the DEI, uh, you know, was recognized by Jewish conservatives as being an existential threat to. Uh, the Jews' ability to work, to study, to do anything that they want to do in America. So if the Zionism is racism, BDS was about ostracizing them and turning them into lepers in American society, then DEI is about pushing them out and making them poor and unsuccessful and at the mercy of people who uh, have their positions because they're not Jewish and because they're actively involved in 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 organizing institutions and America more generally around the principle of ostracizing and keeping Jews down. So anti-Semitism, uh, Jew hatred. So here, you know, October 7th was really a hinge moment for that as well, because first you saw both the anti-Zionism coming to the fore, right, where you see calls for Jewish genocide all over the country and obviously first and foremost in college campuses, but, you know, all over the streets of every city and political events, um, everywhere you, I mean, President Biden has now twice been uh, screamed down in, uh, in, in uh, speeches by pro-Hamas supporters calling for a ceasefire now to enable Hamas to survive and cause Israel a strategic defeat in the battlefield. And and, and more generally on the strategic uh, chessboard of the Middle East. Um, and, um, you know, so there, it, so, so October, this, this was their response to October 7th. 
was to say we support genocide. And again, I've said I think four times already on the show that Harvard Harris poll that showed that 51% of Harvard students think that Israel should be annihilated. You know, which I, I still can't get my hand around, but whatever. And you know, like the majority of Harvard students uh, think that the Jews should be annihilated. And um, so the American Jews, liberal and conservatives, were faced with this situation. And um, again, conservative Jews, they, they're they shocked and they're upset about it. But, you know, if, if you take Ben Shapiro on one side and, I don't know, Jeremy Benami on the other side from J Street, you know, Ben Shapiro has a much easier uh, time understanding what's happening than, you know, a, a, a left-wing Jew, than Bernie Sanders does, right? And then the question is, okay, because it's obvious that this is both of these things are really an existential threat to American Jews, and how are they going to respond to it? Are, are they going to be able to organize themselves, reorganize themselves to fight these things, to fight the anti-Zionist canards that the majority of American Jews have invested their money, their time, their hearts, their souls, into trying to mitigate by saying that they're pro-Palestinians and attacking Israel for not making enough concessions to the Palestinians. You know, this has been going on for decades. Um, are they going to be willing to revise like the residents of uh, Be'eri have their ideas and say, okay, this really is a zero-sum game and what we have to do is stand by Israel and rally around Israel and and demand that America stand with Israel and 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 uh, support its efforts to defeat this evil, or are they going to continue to hem and haw and end up siding with the Palestinians against Israel because equity and because uh, oppressor and oppress and and apply these DEI concepts to to the Jews of Israel uh, to to the extent that they're willing to side with people who want to annihilate the Jewish state in order to preserve their position in American on the American left. So that's their question there. And then the question with DEI is, are they willing to stand by idly and watch themselves and their children and their grandchildren be denied the ability, any ability really, to succeed in the United States? And, um, you know, that's, that's the question. And, I, and, and when I was pondering this, I saw my brother sent me, an article that uh, Carol Markowitz, who was a uh, uh, guest on this show several months ago, she's a fantastic writer and thinker. Uh, she moved from uh, New York to Florida during the COVID uh, because they were keeping our kids out of uh, out of uh, school in Brooklyn. And uh, so she wrote this piece that uh, my brother Doug sent to me um, called Leave the Pews. And I just want to quote you a couple. Of, it was published on Real Clear Politics this week. And uh, she, I just want to read you a couple of uh, of paragraphs from her from her from her essay. So called "Leave the Pews," and it, she wrote here, "It seemed like a good idea. College campuses across the country were erupting in Jew-hating outbursts, and parents were rightly worried about their Jewish college-age kids caught up in the frenzy of hate." On Facebook, a group called Mothers Against College Anti-Semitism was founded and grew quickly to over 50,000 members. They shared information, emailed, called, and signed petitions. They stood united against the oldest hatred, rearing its head again. But just as fast, fissures formed. The cudgel of DEI, that is, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies had been used. Policies that had been used against Jewish students was a subject of feverish debate. Sure, the policies were bad for Jews. But weren't we all good liberals after all? Shouldn't that take precedence here? People earnestly wondered whether other minority groups would be mad at them if they fought to end DEI instead of simply fighting to get Jews included in the special identity groups recognized by the absurd system. So in no, it's not, you know, let us be oppressed too. Don't make us oppressors. I mean, we are oppressed, but the whole idea of DEI is to push Jews out and and to say that it's all their failure is all a Jewish conspiracy. So you can't you can't actually do what they want to do. But just like they're trying to say that the Palestinians don't really hate Israel and Israel is the oppressor and the Palestinians are the oppressed. So they're trying to do the same thing to themselves and, um, you know, and to their children. And so and she went on and she writes, it wasn't just DEI either. When Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced a plan to fast track Jewish students who were feeling unsafe in their own universities who wanted to transfer to Florida College, where he pledged that they would be protected, commentators in the group, in the Facebook group, 
warned not to accept his kindness as he was on the wrong political side. And then here's the clincher. What became clear within that Facebook group is in so and in so many other quarters since October 7th is that much of secular Judaism in both the Reform and Conservative branches had become overtly political and not really religiously based at all. For many Jews, their religious identity had become so intertwined with leftist policies that they couldn't force a separation even when they themselves were being targeted with their own bad ideas. So she says, uh, Carol argues that the that the response really should be to leave the pews. If your re reform and conservative rabbis won't stand with you and, you know, can't get over their idea that that Judaism is just, uh, you know, whatever the Democratic Party sides with, you know, from time to time, then leave. And that's true, but I think that's only part of it because I think the, the real issue isn't leaving the pews per se, but it's finding new pews or building new pews you know you, you the the american jews who have allowed their leaders to conflate judaism with the democratic party and to believe that tikkun olam which is a minor concept in in judaism and has been redefined by progressive jews to mean communism and that tikkun olam is judaism you know they have to realize that this isn't true that this is this was a total fabrication. It was never correct. It was never a an encapsulation of of Judaism in in two in in two words. The repairing the world. It's three words in English. It, it, it's it it's not that's not what Judaism is. Judaism is, is an extraordinary religious tradition and a brilliant one, and well worth learning spending a little bit of time learning, familiarizing yourselves with what Judaism actually is, both religiously, culturally, historically, nationally, geographically, all of these things uh, have been denied American Jews, secular American Jews, for three generations. And it's time to r restore your birthright and learn and you know join, form, study groups to learn Jewish texts you can do it on Zoom. You can do it together. You should congregate together because that's how you build a community by physically meeting. But you know, you you, you also have to learn what Zionism is. You it, because when you do, you also learn why they're attacking you, and you have to accept that Judaism. You know, the people who thought it, and most Jews did it. I know it's been overblown, but Judaism is not Seinfeld, and it's not having a good sense of humor, and it's not bagels and locks. You know it. It's a it's a vast and beautiful religious tradition and heritage, and it, it it's a it's a little tiny self enclosed civilization, and you're a member of it, and and you should know about it because it it's yours, and 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 it's important, and and Jews, I think, you know, I think that just as Jews in Israel like the residents of Be'eri and Nachal Oz and all the rest of it, ha ha who were on the far left on October 6th, have woken up to the dangers and recognized that this is the time for fighting and winning and that it's either us or them, which is just true. I think that there was an awakening among American Jews who needed to be awoken, the, the liberal American Jews who needed to be awoken. I think they were, they were, they did wake up. I think you did wake up. And you know, the leaders, just as in Israel, our leaders who have advanced professionally and personally because they've embraced this idea of Jewish duplicity here or there and guilt, etc. And they won't, they're going to be forced to change their views here. And I think, um, I think that the Jews of America have to fight. They have to fight for themselves there. They have to fight to end DEI in the United States. They have to fight for all of the institutions in the United States to adopt the definition of, of anti-Semitism uh, that was put out, that it was embraced, that was adopted by the State Department under Obama. Now, the Biden administration, just before uh, October 6th, working with you know, these very far left Jewish organizations, started walking away from it. But IRA very importantly says that anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism. And, and having a double standard for Israel is a form of anti-Semitism. And American Jews have to adopt that view themselves and have to have to fight for it because they're being attacked by a very 
specific form of anti-Semitism today, which is anti-Zionism. And if they themselves are saying that it's not a form of anti-Jewish bigotry, then how are they going to fight it? So that's one of the important things. The other one is they have to fight to end DEI. And, you know, part of the problem for American Jews is that the other people who are fighting DEI are people who are not progressives. They're, you know, Christians, they're Republicans, they're all kinds of things, but they're generally not found, you know, uh, well, well representative among Democratic Party activists. And I think that, you know, the more that Jews in America learn about Judaism, learn about who who you are, the less fearful you'll be of the people who are allied on your side, because it works out that at the end of the day, their vision of the United States is much more similar to yours and to what America always was until it was taken over or captivated by this DEI regime than they, than, than they have, than you ever imagined. And I think that the minute that you realize that, it'll be easy and, and you'll feel right working with them because America needs to end DEI in order to survive. And you need to end DEI in order for America to survive, in order for your own community to survive. And you need to know about Judaism in order to survive as well, because the, the threat to the U.S. Jewish community is existential. And it's not being accurately right now or a- adequately right now. And I think that this really is a time for choosing. Everything became clear on October 7th. And it's true that for the right, it was always clear. And it doesn't mean that we suffered less. And it doesn't mean that we're sacrificing less now. But it means that the people who were deluding themselves for 50 years are are the ones that are being challenged now. And they're the ones that have to wake up to the danger because it, we have to fight together. Anyway, those are my thoughts for now. And I'll talk to you again, I think, tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.